Joel Marola will be giving the paper. Joe got his PhD at MIT, uh, spent some time at Exxon doing research related to catalysis, and has been at BPI for seven years now, uh, continuing catalytic related research. The title of the paper is Aqueous Organometallic Chemistry of Iridium Catalysis of Olefin Hydrogenation, Oligomerization, and Other Reactions. Thanks, Dwayne. I'd like to, um, Barbara isn't here right now, but I'd like to thank her for extending her invitation out beyond the tri-state area to uh, get over into Virginia um, to have this opportunity to come here because uh, it's been a long time since my Exxon days where I've got to hear so much in terms of heterogeneous catalysis. Uh, I've always enjoyed that and got a lot of good ideas from uh, hearing people talk about that area. And uh, at least today, I don't want to get into the discussion of homogeneous versus heterogeneous. I think we all recognize that they each have their advantages, disadvantages, and places in the reaction. Um, but I, what I do want to say, at least philosophically here, is that studying homogeneous systems really has one great advantage, is that the number of structural sensitive tools that you can bring to bear, such as NMR spectroscopy and even single crystal x-ray crystallography, if you're lucky enough to isolate some materials, really gives you much more information and does give you the ability to uh, learn a lot about possible mechanisms in your system. So we're, we're, we're fortunate that way, but as you'll see, we're also somewhat unfortunate from the point of view that maybe that can lead you down the wrong pathway. Before I begin, since uh, as someone else pointed out, it's sometimes hard to uh, remember to do this at the end, I'd like to begin by acknowledging in the early parts of this work um, Trang Lee, who is currently doing a postdoc uh, at the University of Hawaii, um, began a lot of our foray into aqueous chemistry. Kelly Matthews continued it. Uh, this fellow who is in the audience and you saw his poster yesterday, he didn't really deal with this work, but he was a really uh, great person to uh, have as a student. In terms of the current folks, the work I'm going to tell you about today, uh, in addition to Trang Lee and Kelly Matthews, is the work of uh, Marion Franks and Rob Pafford and uh, Paul Cherrick. You've already heard a lot of his contributions. In terms of uh, aqueous catalysis, I think one of the things that I certainly don't want to oversell is that water as a solvent is no panacea. Yet it has real advantages in terms of homogeneous catalysis. Paul's already talked about some of that. But certainly in product separation and in the unique solvent properties of water, if you can really take advantage of those, you really can do some good. And there is significant environmental benefits, not only in terms of the toxicity of the water, but in terms of, uh, of disposal problems later on. And that's really not an oversell because there's already some commercial success in terms of that, and that is in the area of uh, Hydroformylation chemistry, um, a Rome Palenc, Ruhr Kimi, now Herc Selene's uh, process to do an aqueous uh, phase hydroformylation of propylene. Um, in speaking last year with uh, one of the managers of Herc Selene's in charge of this process, he, he basically said that running this process for them in water um, solved their or, or cut down their environmental headaches by about a million fold was his uh, statement. So there are some real benefits to doing this. Now this slide also introduces that there are really two ways that you can think about taking current systems and moving them into aqueous solution. As Paul said, that the area of organometallic chemistry is usually not thought of as one that is easily amenable to working in an aqueous solution. And the first of the ways is to take a a ligand such as triphenylphosphine, which we all know works very nicely in <coughs> homogeneous systems, and sulfonate it, thus turning it into a water-soluble ligand, and then using this to put onto the metal, that water solubility then brings your whole system in, and then you can look at some chemistry along those ways. And as I said, this is being um, commercially uh, used in terms of hydroformylation uh, with my uh, former colleague, uh, Mark Davis, before he moved to that smaller technical school on the West Coast, uh, we looked at some uh, uh, aqu uh, supported aqueous phase work using uh, that type of a system. But the thing that intrigues me more is, are those systems that the water solubility does not derive from simply making soluble 
a formerly insoluble ligand, but rather those systems where you have some specific water to metal interactions that do something unique and good. And probably this area got a real kick when uh, Bob Grubbs and Bruce Novak uh, showed that actually for a metathesis reaction, we're missing a double bond uh, over on this side, but for an olefin metathesis reaction, which you normally thought of as involving uh, metals and aluminum alkyls and systems that uh, you have to keep rigorously dry, they showed that here the ruthenium chloride was a system that actually worked much better in water, and then they've gone on to improve this, but to show that here was a system where you can get great catalytic activity in an aqueous system, and it isn't a, simply a system that you transferred from organic solvent to aqueous solvent just by uh, putting on water-soluble phosphates. When this latter case, I think some of the things that Paul has already told you about uh, really intrigued me about almost historically, if you take a look at inorganic chemistry, everyone knows by looking at freshman chemistry textbooks that inorganic chemistry in the early part of the century is Werner, uh, Alfred Werner types of complexes. We're really dealing with first row types of metals, relatively high oxidation states, uh, amine and oxygen ligand, ligands in terms of aqueous chemistry. And so in the early part of this century, that's really the study of inorganic chemistry. And there's a lot of interesting things that are still yet to be known about these types of complexes. But with the discovery of ferrocene um, in certainly the mid part of this century, the move of uh, certainly the bulk of the inorganic community went to organometallic chemistry. And then not only uh, do we have this, these very unique types of materials, but then people noticed that you could do a lot of very interesting catalysis. Metal carbonyl complexes in terms of syngas chemistry, hydroformylation chemistry, metal carbenes in terms of olefin metathesis. And so from the mid part of the century, you saw this big movement uh, away from the more classical type over to the organometallic type. And what intrigues me is the possibility that the synergism, uh, if you will, by going now and bridging those two very different areas can really lead to some unique chemistry. So what I want to tell you about today is some other work. Paul's told you one part of the things that we're doing. But I'd like to tell you about some other work that we're doing to try to understand the nature of water to metal interactions, what kinds of things that we can do in aqueous solution, and what we can do to fine tune that. So I'd like to spend a bit of time on a hydrogenation system first. Not simply because we're so interested in hydrogenation. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure the world is really uh, battering down anybody's doorstep for another hydrogenation catalyst. But it's a simple enough system that we can learn a lot about the water to metal interactions and then hopefully use that knowledge to fine tune and develop other systems uh, that might be of more and unique interest. So after I spend some time about on that, let me then tell you at least some of the ways that we're heading and give you some preliminary information on some of what I think are more unique systems. Some of the things that we've been doing to do the final bit of setting the stage is that we've been working with this very nice, very electron-rich tristrimethylphosphine iridium COD complex in my group for a number of years because we are very much interested in developing catalysts, not only those that work in water, but those that work anywhere, for trying to do some unique types of catalytic reactions. The addition of CH bonds to unsaturates, the addition of NH bonds to get a catalytic amination type of a system, the addition of OH bonds. And so one of the things that we've been doing is just looking at this first step, the oxidative addition of these types of bonds to this iridium center. And everything that, we, that is kind of cartoonized on this slide, we've been able to demonstrate. Is this is a very electron-rich iridium system. We are able to do the oxidative addition of all of these variety of bonds to the metal center. And then from there, we take a look at the hydrides that we create and see what kind of reactivity and kind of in a stepwise fashion, we try to feel our way to developing a catalytic system. What I want to focus on now is this particular reaction, the addition of H2 to this complex to knock off the COD and to give us a dihydride. That synthesis is just again repeated here. If we start back iridium trichloride, which we can purchase commercially, we add cyclooctadiene and heat this up in an alcohol solvent. 
you get a reduction of the iridium-3 to an iridium-1 to give you this iridium cyclooctadiene chlorobridge dimer. Addition of trimethylphosphine to that in a toluene solution will precipitate in very nearly quantitative yield this tristrimethylphosphine iridium COD chloride. And then we use that for a lot of different uh, reactions. In this case, if we add H2 to this, in mesitylene at about 80 to 100 degrees centigrade, as Paul mentioned, it does take a, a little bit to add H2 and knock off the cyclooctadiene. We get excellent yields of this iridium dihydrido chloro complex. Let me just show you a little bit of the spectroscopic information because we're going to look at this in order to try to understand its, its solution chemistry. But one of the things that we get is we get a lot of structural information by both proton NMR and the phosphorus 31 NMR spectrum. In terms of the phosphorus 31 NMR, it's pretty clear cut. We have three phosphines, two in uh, the same environment, one in a different environment. And because of phosphorus-phosphorus uh, coupling, uh, this phosphorus that is next to the two uh, appears as a triplet. And these two phosphorus atoms which is only next to one, uh, appears as a doublet. So we can get some nice information there. And then in terms of the proton NMR spectrum, what we see are some very unique resonances that are indicative of metal hydrides here at 20 parts per million above TMS, delta of minus 20. Uh, we see a, a relatively complex pattern, but if you blow it up, what you see is you can actually pick out the fact that there is coupling to three phosphoruses to um, this hydride. This hydride is actually the one trans to the chlorine, and we even have a little bit of coupling from this hydrogen to that one. The other resonance at about minus nine and a half parts per million is due to the hydrogen atom that's trans to a phosphorus, and it actually gets a very big coupling when it's trans to give us this coupling, another coupling to two other phosphines, and then another little bit of coupling to the other hydrogen. So we can get a lot of information from um, the NMR spectrum about the structure that we have here. So there's no doubt of what we have and in what the geometry is. Well, in terms of looking at reactions that we could use in a catalytic sequence, we began by looking at unsaturates such as acetylenes and olefins um, for these systems. And initially, Trang, who did this work, showed that if you took this in most organic solvents that we use commonly, things like methylene chloride, chloroform, toluene, acetone, there was absolutely no reaction of this with acetylenes or olefins. And that wasn't too surprising to us because some of the other things that we had been working on showed not much reactivity directly. But with some of the other ones, especially the ones where we generated hydrides by the addition of carbon-hydrogen bonds, what we were able to show is that if we remove the chlorine chemically, using something like thallium PF6, we can generate a coordinatively unsaturated material that would react with acetylenes and give us uh, insertion products that we could study their chemistry. And what she saw here was uh, that's being kind in terms of a horrendous mess. All kinds of things happen. We knew we had a reactive system. But we'd like to try to control that reactivity, and that certainly wasn't the way to do it. And, and so what Trang discovered is that, to our surprise in some respects, is that that dihydrido iridium trisphosphine chloride was water soluble. All right? And in effect, it's one of these things that, ju just being an observant student, in washing out glassware, she noticed that it went into water and, and you know, wasn't something that was necessarily predicted. And she said, well, since it goes into water, she thought maybe she'd just look at its reactivity in water. And sure enough, what she found is that at putting this in water, adding an, an acetylene, um, actually, very uh, nicely, in, in a matter of, oh, maybe 30 to 40 minutes, uh, generated all of this going over to a vinyl iridium hydride complex. And so, the acetylene would add, it would insert, and we could actually isolate um, these particular materials. If R is small or a hydrophilic group, it remains soluble in water, but if R is large and somewhat hydrophobic, this actually precipitates out and we can uh, isolate and characterize those materials. One example, not necessarily because there's anything unique about it, but it did grow the nicest crystals, is that an insertion product of uh, a um, hexane uh, diene 
in which there were two uh, settlings right next to each other. Uh, here's the X-ray crystal structure. Of, here's the vinyl by the insertion into the one of the uh, triple bonds. Here are the three trimethylphosphines, the chlorine, and uh, hydrogens don't show up very well in an X-ray uh, crystal structure next to the very electron-rich uh, iridium, but we know it's there from spectroscopic uh, techniques. And so we can isolate these, and we isolated quite a number of them and studied their chemistry. And what we noted is that at room temperature, we could isolate these. But on warming them up, they would reductively eliminate to form the olefin. And so that suggested that we had the room here for a catalytic cycle of hydrogenation chemistry based on this material. And as a matter of fact, Paul told you about that this morning. And that uh, we uh, believe, well, this tries to show a catalytic cycle. We'll come back to this a little bit later. But in this matter of fact, um, this will reduce alkynes to alkenes, and then it will take the alkenes and take them all the way down to alkanes. And the interesting thing is it is active only in water, and I really mean that, only in water. Not in DMSO, not in acetonitrile, not in ethanol or methanol. It is active only in water. And so we were very much intrigued by A, what is so special about water, and B, what are the species in an aqueous solution that are responsible for this, so that we could understand this chemistry. And so that's what I want to talk about now. We'll come back to this catalytic cycle, but I want to talk about what we've learned about water and the interactions between water and this system. Now remember those NMR spectra that I showed you, both phosphorus and proton, of that dihydrido complex. Those spectra were taken in deuteromethylene chloride. If instead we obtain those spectra in D2O, what you see in terms of the hydride region is instead of one uh, hydride up around minus 21 or minus 20 parts per million, we see one at minus 21 and another one, which is a similar pattern at minus 25. And then again, instead of seeing one at around minus 9, we see another one, similar pattern, uh, somewhat below that. In terms of the phosphorus 31, instead of seeing a doublet and a triplet, we actually see two doublets and two triplets, the other triplet being hidden under this doublet. So that tells us that we have two different species in solution. All right, And these two different species, uh, that's what we wanted to try to get a handle on. What is it that, that we're dealing with here? In terms of the chemistry, though, it's complicated by the fact that hydrogen deuterium exchange occurs quite rapidly with these dihydrido species and D2O. And so actually, the, the hydrogen that is cis to the chlorine um, will actually exchange fast. And by that, we're talking about 20 to 30 minutes uh, in D2O will actually cause that one to exchange completely. The other deuterium takes a little longer, uh, maybe eight to 10 hours, that one is exchanged completely. So we couldn't use proton NMR in a quantitative fashion. But we could still use uh, the phosphorus 31 NMR. And this just gives us further evidence for the fact that we're getting this deuterium exchange, because in D2O, um, it's just fortuitous that this trans deuterium has about the same coupling to a phosphorus as the cis phosphines do. And so instead of seeing a, a triplet for this phosphorus, you actually see a much more complicated pattern due to coupling to two spin one half phosphorus and plus spin one deuterium. But, so you can really tell that there's a deuterium in that transposition. But since this is due to species B, this resonance is due to what I call A plus B, and this is due to A, we can at least get a handle on measurements that deal with A and B by looking at this resonance for B and this one for A. And the information uh, that we had suggested that number one, that if we added sodium chloride to this solution, is that we could cause what is labeled B to completely disappear. So the addition of sodium chloride causes B to disappear, but A to remain. If we add just more material in the solution, just increase the total concentration of iridium complex, again, the relative ratio of A to B, uh, A increases and B decreases. And if we increase temperature, the opposite occurs, that B increases in intensity with increasing temperature, and A decreases. So all of our information suggested 
that these two species were in equilibrium with each other. One was related to the other by loss or, or gain of chloride. And um, so the spectroscopy tells us is that we have to have three <coughs> phosphines in a meridional arrangement. We have to have two hydrides. So for an octahedral iridium complex, that doesn't leave us a whole lot of room for showing a difference. It has to be in that six coordination site. And so Trang then said, well, let's see if we can isolate something from solution. And so quite often, since our thought was is that we were dealing with some ionic complexes, you can, by changing counter ions, isolate species from solution. And by adding hexafluorophosphate as an anion, she was able to isolate and we could crystallographically characterize this very unique um, cation. The anion isn't shown, but it is a chloro-bridged uh, iridium complex. And there are some two unique things about this complex. One is, is that monochloro-bridged species like this are very unusual. It's very um, uh, unusual to see things like this. For example, the COD dimer has two chloride bridges, and so this is a unique material. There are two hydrides still here, by the way, um, on each of these iridium. And so uh, having isolated this in actually fairly good yield from the solution, um, that led us to believe that this was one of the species uh, in solution. It was cationic. That made some sense. And so we also proposed that the other species that was in solution was just the one in which this chlorine had dissociated and to give us an aqua complex of the iridium. So we'd have two cations in solution. They would actually be related to each other by gain or loss of chloride, and, and all of it seemed to make sense. Until we said, well, if that's true, we should be able to study that equilibrium as a function of concentration. And so what we're talking about here is the idea that this aqua species would be in equilibrium with this chloro bridge dimer that we isolated. We did all of the measurements at different concentrations of iridium, did all the measurements of the intensity of those peaks. I don't show it here, but you can come up with a very uh, simple uh, mass expression for this equilibrium. And the important feature of it is, is since two of these go to one of these, there would be a squared dependence on the equilibrium on that particular species. And when we do the calculated uh, equilibria constants based on this data, you can see that they vary all over the map. And so this data shows that this is not consistent with an equilibrium in which we have two species going over um, to one. Well, to make a long story short here, what we're ultimately able to show is that within the experimental error, the only inescapable conclusion that we uh, uh, had to go to is that this neutral species is the other one in solution, in equilibrium with this cationic aqua complex. In terms of doing the mass action expression and calculating the equilibrium constants, within experimental error uh, over this whole range, um, this looks very good. It's, it certainly is consistent with a mononuclear to mononuclear complex. And again, there's only that six site to deal with. And so we have to deal with the fact that it's this neutral chloro that is in solution in equilibrium with this cationic one. Well, we were intrigued by that in terms of what is going on to make that neutral complex water soluble. And then we did a little bit more work in terms of the thermodynamic data for that particular equilibrium. So again, drawing equilibrium like this, where we have the chloride on this side and the aqua complex on that side, we looked at it over a uh, temperature range to calculate the equilibrium constants and uh, looked at the Van Hoff plots and saw some fairly good linear uh, relationship here from which we could look at the delta G, the delta H, and the delta S terms for that equilibrium. And let's focus in on the delta H term. We already know, actually, if we call um, this species is actually what I showed on that previous graph as B, this is actually what is, is shown as A, it's not a favorable equilibrium. There's actually much more A in solution at any time than B. And so and you can see that in that the delta H term is a positive term. Intuitively, that's a satisfying result because, again, in terms of this idea of hardened soft acid base or however you want to look at it, you would 
predict that the bond between iridium and oxygen would be weaker than the bond between iridium and chlorine. And so in that sense, um, the fact that enthalpically um, this would be an unfavorable reaction to break an iridium-chlorine bond and replace it with an iridium-oxygen bond, you would suggest that this delta H term is predominantly the enthalpy change in that particular bond. So that is unfavorable. Why does this reaction go at all if there is a relatively large entropic term here? It's large and positive, and so the fact that it goes at all <coughs> tells us that it is driven uh, pretty much by entropy. Uh, very simple-mindedly, one would suggest that we're going from one particle to two. It's obviously much more complicated than that. We've got a lot of water ordering that, that goes on on both sides of this equation. But we think that because this is very highly hydrogen bonded to the water, as is this, not only through hydrogen bonds to the chlorine, but hydrogen bonds to the hydrogen, we think that there's actually a lot of ordering here and a lot of ordering there. That's a net zero in actual fact, and that, that simple-minded view of going from two particles to one is actually pretty close to the truth in terms of why this is entropically favored. Well, if we're, if we're correct, if that equilibrium does relate to that iridium to chlorine versus iridium to oxygen bond, we should be able to probe that. The first way we should probe that is that if we have a species on the iridium that is softer, would make a stronger iridium bond, then actually we should see less of the aqua species and more of the iridium halide. And so we actually synthesized the bromide complex. And you can see from this NMR spectrum that uh, in actual fact, you see much less of the aqua species, which would be here and under here. Overall, the complex is less soluble than the chloride to begin with because of this, and you see much less of it. And the iodide complex, where you get a really good bond between the soft iridium and the so-called soft iodide, is totally insoluble in water. So you go from that end, you don't get water solubility. <coughs> so if we're correct that that aqua species plays an important role in uh, getting us into solution, we need to go the other way. We need to be able to make a complex that already has an iridium oxygen bond, and I'll leave out the gory details of how we synthesized it, but we actually made a complex that had a, an oxygen donor, a negative oxygen donor, in this case benzoate, in that six site rather than chloride. And what we saw is that this is much more reactive is that when you place this into D2O, now instead of 30 to 40 minutes and 8 to 10 hours, both of these exchange within minutes. And so right away we get some indication that these are much more reactive. Again, adding an acetylene to this, instead of again waiting 20 to 30 minutes, the reaction is very rapid, almost instantaneous, that an acetylene will insert into the uh, iridium H bond. In this case, it was the T-butyl acetylene. And here you can see the T-butyl vinyl. And here's the benzoate group. So the insertion takes place quite rapidly. And then finally, in terms of solution chemistry, when you place this in, into uh, D2O, you see only one species, only the aqua complex, because now the delta H term is effectively zero. We're going from one iridium oxygen bond to another. The entropy term wins out, and so we have only aqua species in the solution. In terms of catalysis, this actually, this complex is much better. It's a much better catalyst, it's much faster. Again, because what we're dealing with here in that catalytic sequence that I pointed out before is that we believe that what happens is that you do have an equilibrium here, but all the chemistry occurs from the aqua, that an alkyne can come in, compete with the water, uh, come into the iridium, do the insertion, the reductive elimination, and hydrogenation get you back to the point. The more of this that we can generate in solution, the better the catalyst. So that was the first point that we learned from this, is in dealing with generating coordinated unsaturation. Why is water so good? Well, number one, water is unique for the, sol the solvation of chloride. Okay? Methanol isn't <coughs> as good at solvating chloride. Okay? So water is very unique, and so it can pull the chloride off to generate coordinated unsaturation. 
we learned something about the enthalpy that we needed, and so by going then to a carboxylate here, we can actually get to an even better system. <laughs> well, how do we get to even more active systems? And then how do we even get to different systems? Remember I said hydrogenation isn't necessarily the goal. Well, one thing that is, is very intriguing is Paul mentioned something about trying to do alkyne hydrogenation and the problem of terminal alkynes adding. One of the things that we were able to do with this system that's a little bit different is that if we leave out the water, what happens with the terminal alkyne? Well, if we leave out the water, truth be told, we would have liked to have or leave out the hydrogen. Truth be told, if we uh, left out the hydrogen, we would have liked the water to have added and uh, have developed a hydration catalyst. That doesn't work, at least for this system, the water does add, by the way. We have isolated and characterized the oxidative addition products of water with the metal, a hydroxy iridium hydride. But that doesn't appear to go to anywhere productive. Instead, what happens is if you just leave out the hydrogen, you make these ene ions by a CH addition first, giving you an alkynyl iridium hydride, which then reacts with another alkyne to insert to give you the vinyl, they couple, and we can actually catalytically make these ene ions in water. So that's one thing different. The water doesn't interfere with this at all, and so we can do some very different and very interesting chemistry. Well, Paul also uh, mentioned to you that, well, one of the things we like to do, perhaps, is to get more coordinative unsaturation. And so in that particular case, more coordinative unsaturation uh, could be obtained by putting only two phosphines on. That was nicely water-soluble. That is much more reactive with hydrogen. Just like Paul's systems, these react with H2 like a shot at room temperature. They hydrogenate uh, uh, species rapidly at, at room temperature. They retain water solubility. These are much more active phosphine-based water-soluble catalysts than are the trisphosphines that I just showed you. Well, finally, let me um, mention one last thing in terms of how do we get into some new chemistry. And one of the ways is, is that a dihydride is excellent for hydrogenation chemistry because it delivers two H's. We wanted to get into some olefin oligomerization chemistry that we would like to start with only one H. And so one of the things we wanted to do is instead of adding H2, add HCl to this system. And in a very strange um, system, we found that this cationic iridium COD complex is actually itself fairly basic. Um, it will be protonated by HCl, and as a matter of fact, if we look at it in, in a different sense, instead of uh, starting from that particular point, if we put this into water with pyridinium hydrochloride, the H will transfer from pyridine to the hydrogen to give you an equilibrium constant of about 0.8 for this reaction, from which we can back out that the pKa of this iridium H species is about 5. So overall, we're about the same basicity here as pyridine. Surprisingly, uh, just as an aside, when we added HCl to this in a non-aqueous solvent by bubbling anhydrous HCl through it, um, the elemental analysis of this compound was always coming back uh, way low in carbon and hydrogen. And it took us a while to figure out that this was very tenaciously holding on to two extra equivalents of HCl in the lattice. And as a matter of fact, we've since got a lot of evidence that we have this bichloride um, type of anion instead of just a simple chloride. That led to some other very interesting chemistry instead of chloride, in, in terms of chloride. Um, all of these extra chlorides, for example, can lead to some very intriguing iridium chloro bridge dimers, which are going to get us into some other chemistry. But ultimately, if we take the HCl, dissolve it up in water, try to neutralize off those extra HCls, and then cook up that solution, we can get to a monohydrido species. Or, it turns out, we can just start from the dihydride, add one equivalent of HCl carefully, it will protonate off one of the hydrides, and it will now give us a dichloride. Now we have our monohydride. What does it do? Well, I can't tell you a whole lot about the details. It's fairly water-soluble, and what we do know now is that it will polymerize water-soluble olefins. Okay, it will polymerize acrylic acid, it will polymerize 
enzymes acrylamide. Those are fairly easy ones to polymerize. But nevertheless, if we are a true metal-based system, we should be able to have very different types of dispersions and, uh, and other properties that we could tailor for these types of systems. The other thing that we've shown is that we can get some oligomerization of allyl alcohol with this system. We don't know how far or how extensive yet. We're now working on learning how to characterize some of these materials. But here we have what I think are very unique water-soluble olefin oligomerization catalysts. And I can talk some more individually about some of the properties of these iridium complexes. What I think is unique about them is even though they're water-soluble, they, they will interact with water but aren't killed by water, actually cationic iridium-3 complexes actually have significant Lewis acidity, almost rivaling that of an early metal. And we, can, we have some examples of where that, that may be. And so that's where we're heading now. We're also showing that actually if we do some chemistry instead of with chlorides or triflates here, we get better chemistry in water. That's to be expected because it's an oxygen donor and we can separate those even better. And then finally, we've actually made some monohydrides where these are amino acids or an amino acid chelating, uh, which could perhaps bring in some asymmetry to the system. So this last part, the more unique part, the more intriguing part, we don't have a lot of detail yet, but I hope to, over the next uh, year or so, really understand some of this chemistry a lot more. Well, let me just finish up by saying that this turned out to be a very surprisingly water-soluble system, which we think we understand a little bit because of this equilibrium. That we, if we just take this system and change X, we can affect the chemistry. And then we're leading on to bisphosphine complexes and monohydrido complexes. And as Paul told you, amine ligands uh, can play an important role. And if you remember anything about classical Werner types of complexes, because of the acidity of NH bonds on amine ligands attached to metals, we can actually get into some unique chemistry of metal to nitrogen multiple bonding, which can lead us into some new catalysts. And so I hope maybe, um, maybe at the next meeting, I'll be able to tell you some more about that. In addition to my students, I'd like to thank the National Science Foundation, the Petroleum Research Fund, an early grant from the Exxon Education Foundation and Jeffers Trust for the financial support. And again, thank you, Barbara, for letting us know about this uh, symposium, and thank you for your attention. stupid, but um, we're always dealing with deactivation on our catalyst. Would you envision that uh, if you had a, a system where you were continually uh, running, taking your product off, that these catalysts would deactivate or just go on forever? And that's hard to say at this stage. We don't know enough about these systems. Certainly if you take a look at those homogeneous systems that are commercially uh, um, run right now, is that, uh, you know, those are problems that had to be worked out and were worked out, both in terms of the Monsanto acetic acid process, the union carbide oxo process. You know, all of those systems, you know, dealing with precious metals, um, those are problems that, that, that have been gone, uh, uh, overcome. I just don't know enough about these systems as to what their possible deactivation pathways are or what they'll do. So we're, we're really early to say that, but I'm not, I'm confident that if anything ultimately would come of these, that would be one of the problems that would have to be worked out. Um, I suppose you can activate deuterium as well as hydrogen. Absolutely, yes. Now, can you take and activate uh, acetylene and then bring the activated deuterium together with the activated uh, acetylene compound? Will you, could you demonstrate a hydrogenation? In other words, with, with a donor, could you get a transfer of hydrogen? Um, yes, I mean, uh, if I understand you, if we take D2... There's two separate solutions. One hydrogenated and activated, the other with uh, suddenly detached. Did you show that? Oh, two complexes like that, yeah. Two well, actually, what we were able to do is that if we take the H2 complex, and as I said, stir it in D2O, we turn those into deuteriums, and then bring in the acetylene, and then we get the deuterium added onto the acetylene. What is a handsome hydrogen directly transferable? In other words, uh, can you, you think this solution with the hydrogen and this solution with the activate bring them together and transfer the hydrogen? Yes, I think so. 
So those two species are able to interact in this. In a bimolecular fashion, I'm not sure exactly how they would interact that way, but in this case, it's the acetylene that actually is already interacting with the metal that has the two hydrogens on it. So it's all intramolecular. Well, kind of <coughs> there is some belief that, that those type, that type of mechanism does occur with some catalyst systems where you have one thing here, hydrogen over here, and in the bimolecular fashion, it comes together. Um, like we don't think that's happening, like the cobalt, yeah. I don't think that's happening here. But easy to do, wouldn't it? Yes, sir. Take two solutions and that's a good thought. I just wanted to ask you whether you have tried any catalysts or also related to the Yeah, we, we've had a few studies on CO2, and, and, and um, that leads us into, um, I don't have an answer to that because, as you could clearly see here, if we take the dihydride and protonate it, we get to a monohydride. Actually, if we then, so anything we do to increase the acidity of the system gets us into a different system. Anything we do to actually decrease the acidity of the system actually deprotonates the metal, gets us into something else. So that's another point of control which I didn't talk about today because we don't know what it does yet. We're still trying to feel our way. So uh, this is a system where you do have to think about where you are in pH because you end up with getting very different things based upon pH and CO2 is one of those things that would do that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.